coming to you not so live from Nebraska City, Nebraska. Welcome to you out there, and thanks for joining us for our fourth podcast. Fourth, fourth, yep, we're up to four. It's fourth of a weekly series to discuss the Lewis and Clark Expedition. The focus will be on the journal entries for the current week to illuminate our listeners as to where the core of discovery is and what they're doing at the time in the years 1804, 1805, and 1806 the years of the expedition as it set out and returned to St. Louis. Occasional events before and after those years will be discussed. The language used in this podcast assumes that the listener has tuned in to prior podcasts and thus has some background information in mind. This podcast is being produced and presented by the Missouri River Basin, Lewis and Clark Interpretive Trail and Visitor Center in Nebraska City, Nebraska. You can find us on Facebook by searching MRB, Lewis and Clark Center, and check out our website at lewisandclarkvisitorscenter.org. We are located along the Missouri River, along the route of the expedition. We have three floors of Lewis and Clark-themed exhibits, walking and hiking trails, and a Plains Indian Earth Lodge replica. This week, August 22nd to August 28th, in 1804, sees... George Shannon getting lost while out hunting, and contact with the Yankton Sioux. 1805 has the Corps amongst the Shoshone in what is a, turns out to be a pretty ideal week for the Corps. And 1806, they're coming back down the Missouri in modern-day South Dakota, anticipating a likely heated encounter with the Teton Sioux. August 22nd to August 28th, 1804. The Corps started the week a couple of miles south of modern-day Ponca, Nebraska, and finished at modern-day Yankton, South Dakota. The Corps started the week headed upstream, making good time with favorable conditions for most of the week. On August 26th, near present-day Vermilion, South Dakota, George Shannon, the Corps' youngest member at age 19, is sent out to hunt for a few of the expedition's horses that have wandered off, and he fails to return to camp. The two days later, on the 28th, uh, there are three notable events. First, they make contact with the Yankton Sioux and will camp with them and have counsel from August 29th to August 31st. Uh, the Yankton had a friendly reputation, unlike the Teton Sioux, who were still north of the Yankton on the river. Secondly, Clark points out that a detachment sent to look for Shannon had seen his footprints and a horse's footprints headed north, ahead of them on the river. Immediately, this would have been of great concern. Shannon was ahead of them and presumed that he thought that the expedition was in front of them, um, in front of him, headed upstream. So in his mind, he is headed upstream trying to catch the group. And the captains knew that they would be camped amongst the Yankton for several days, not proceeding upstream in chase of him. So Shannon would be venturing ever more ahead of them. This was of concern. George Shannon's fate is hanging in the balance at this time. He is out there alone in new and possibly hostile territory. And the third event of the 28th, as Clark writes in his journal on the day, before we landed, the French run a snag through their pirogue and like to have sunk. We had her unloaded from an examination found that the pirogue was unfit for service and determined to send her back by the party intended to send back and take their pirogue. We accordingly changed the loads. Some of the loading was wet. What Clark is saying here is that the plan is to send Corporal Warfington and the Red Pirogue back, presumably soon, to St. Louis, to provide an update to the United States as to the progression of the expedition. It's just worth noting because it is actually the keel boat that is set back, and not until April of 1805. Evidently, they had wanted to send Warfington back sooner, and with the Red Pirogue, but they don't. A quick background of the boats of the expedition at this point. They set out from St. Louis with the keel boat, a 55-foot long and nearly 9-foot wide craft, Um, storing most of the provisions. The Red Pirogue, 
which was uh, piloted by the French Engagis, it was the second largest vessel being 40, uh, 41 foot long and 9 feet wide. And then there was the White Pirogue, a 35 foot long, 5 foot wide craft. Uh, also there was Lewis's iron boat frame, which was disassembled at this point. It was a custom-made craft for Lewis that was de uh, designed to be incredibly portable and light and could be assembled on demand with the purpose of using upstream when the Missouri grew shallow. And they had a couple of canoes also. More time will be devoted to each boat in the future when demanded by the journal entries. Uh, next week in 1804, you can expect an update on George Shannon's escapade and learn the takeaways from the Council with the Yankton. August 22nd to August 28th, 1805. From Camp Fortunate with the Shoshone, pushing onward to the west to the lower Lamy village. The bullet points for this week in 1805 is that things go remarkably favorable for the Corps. They had found the Shoshone. Sacagawea was back at home with her blood relatives. They had procured horses and a guide, and were headed west. The stretch of land this week is the furthest south the expedition had been in about a year, and was also the furthest south that they would be until they reached this point again on the return trip after reaching the Pacific Ocean. Over the next three weeks, they head almost straight north from here, and then west. On August 24th, Clark recommends a plan to Lewis about how to proceed on, which is ultimately adopted by the Corps. He writes, The plan I stated to Captain Lewis, if he agrees with me, we shall adopt is to procure as many horses, one for each man if possible, and to hire my present guide, who I sent on to him, to integrate through the interpreter and proceed on by land to some navigable part of the Columbia River, or to the ocean, depending on what provisions we can procure food by the gun, in addition to the small stock that we have on hand, depending on our horses as the last resort. <laughs> One long William Clark sentence right there. The Shoshone guide who is hired almost always is referred to at this point and on as being named Old Toby. But the name Old Toby does not appear in the journals until the return trip on May 12, 1806, while in camping uh, among the Nez Perce at Camp uh, Chopinish on the other side of the mountains, where they are camped for a few weeks waiting for some of the 12 feet of snow in the mountains to melt. Back in 1805, there are almost daily mentions of the guide, the old guide, uh, for the coming weeks but he is never explicitly named in 1805. Um, all that is ever uh, said um, in a descriptive nature of him is that he is old and is sometime, uh, sometimes accompanied by his son. The Clark May 12, 1806 entry reads, We have now six horses out only, as our old guide Toby and his son each took a horse of ours when they returned last fall. So there's the story of how historians retroactively attach the name Old Toby to being the same old guide, which does seem highly likely that he is, in fact, the same person. Anyway, uh, here's quite a quote from Lewis on August 26th. One of the women who had been assisting in the transportation of the baggage halted at a little run about a mile behind us and set on the two pack horses which she had been conducting by one of her, f of her female friends. I inquired of Kamehameha the cause of her detention and was informed by him in an unconcerned manner that she had halted to bring forth a child and would soon overtake us. In about an hour the woman arrived with her newborn babe and passed us on her way to the camp, apparently as well as she ever was. <laughs> Unreal. You know, micro-events like this are not learned material in the classroom when studying Lewis and Clark, but this is the type of entry that just make this expedition the uh, essence of the moments, time and again, shape the picture for us today. Later in the day, Lewis adds, 
I wish to purchase twenty horses of himself, his people, to convey our baggage. He observed that the Minotauris had stolen a great number of their horses this spring, but hoped his people would spare me a number I wished. I also asked another guide. He observed that he had no doubt but the old man who was with Captain Clark would accompany us if we wished him, and that he was better informed of the country than any other. Matters being thus far arranged, I directed the fiddle to be played, and the party danced very merrily, much to the amusement and gratific excuse me, gratification of the natives. Though I must confess that the state of my own mind at this time did not well accord with the prevailing mirth, as I somewhat feared that the caprice of the Indians might suddenly induce them to withhold their horses from us without which my hopes of prosecuting my voyage to the advantage was lost. Whatever sleep Lewis lost that night was short-lived, as the next day John Ordway writes, Captain Lewis bought eight or nine horses this day. The natives do not wish to part with any more of their horses without getting a higher price for them. And the day after that, on August 28th, Clark writes that Lewis had procured 22 more horses. Uh, at this, on this date, John Ordway lists the inventory of horses at 25. So they now had the desired quantity of horses, they had a guide, and they had a direction of which to aim. It was a good week for them. August 22nd to August 28th, 1806. They started the week in South Dakota near the North Dakota uh, border and ended all the way down to near modern-day Chamberlain, South Dakota, near Interstate 90. They had almost managed to cross the entire state of South Dakota in one week. What it must have felt like going downstream, accomplishing distances in one week that took nearly a month to navigate going up the river in 1804. Leaving the Mandan villages, the Corps of Discovery was headed towards Teton Sioux country. The interaction was inevitable. It had been almost two years exactly since they encountered the Tetons. No doubt neither party had forgotten the tense circumstances of that meeting which will be discussed in an upcoming podcast very soon in 1804, uh, once they encounter the Teton Sioux for the first time in September of that year. But on August 25th of 1806, where we are now, Clark writes, At 3 p.m. we passed the place where we saw the last encampment of troublesome Tetons below the old Ponia village on the southwest side. Clark is returning, uh, referring to the journey up in 1804. This location signifies the northern portion of Teton Sioux land as they knew it. They were back in Teton territory, and their guard was up. Later that day, he writes, The Arikaras had formerly a large village on each side of the river which was destroyed by the Teton Sioux. There is the remains of five other villages on the southwest side below the Cheyenne River and one on an island. All of these villages have been broken up by the Sioux. They made 48 miles that day and noted that it had not been long since the Tetons were on the river here. The next day on August 26, Clark writes, at 8 a.m. past the place the Tetons were encamped at the, at the time they attempted to stop us in September 1804, and at 9 a.m. past the entrance of Teton River. He goes on to say, As we were now in the country where we were informed, the Sioux were assembled, we were much on our guard, determined to put up with no insults from those bands of Sioux. All the arms are in perfect working order. At this time, Lewis was nursing a leg or hip injury. He was shot on August 11th in a hunting accident, likely by one of his own men. The wound went through his thigh and did not hit the bone. Another example of, a, of the core getting lucky. Certainly, if it had contacted the bone, the large caliber ball would have likely shattered the bone, 
or worse, if it hit an artery or a vital organ, the wound would have likely proved fatal. So he had been in the pirogue, recovering uh, slowly, resting. They end the week still having not seen the Teton Sioux. They were only three to four days from the Yankton Sioux land, the same village that they are currently at in 1804, as mentioned earlier in this podcast. I like to think they would have started to feel somewhat optimistic that they may escape the watchful eye of the Teton on the return voyage. But on August 30th, the Corps of Discovery and the Teton Sioux's path would collide. And that concludes this week's podcast. Please join us again next week and subscribe to our YouTube page uh, to learn just what the Corps of Discovery has in store for them and what they have in store for us as students of their journals. Keep close to nature's heart and break clear away once in a while and climb a mountain or spend a week in the woods. Wash your spirit clean. John Muir. Thanks for tuning in.